All right, what's going on, everybody? Hash tables. A hash table is a collection of key value pairs. Each key value pair is known as an entry. We have two pieces of data. The first is the key, and the second is the value. In this example, let's pretend that we're a teacher and we need to create a hash table of all of our students. Each student has a name and a unique student ID number, but these can be of any data type that you would like. In this example, the key will be an integer and the value will be a string. So how do we know at which index to place each of these entries? Well, what we could do is take each key and insert it into a hash code method. The hash code method will take a key as input plug it into a formula, and spit out an integer. This integer is known as a hash. Now, if we're finding the hash code of an integer in Java, that's actually really easy. The formula is the number itself. So the hash of 100 is 100, 123 is 123, so on and so forth with the other keys. So after finding the hash of your key, now what can we do? These numbers are way too large, and the size of our hash table is only 10 elements. What we'll do next is take each of these hashes and divide each of them by the capacity, the size of our hash table. We have 10 elements. So take each hash, divide it by the capacity of our hash table. Whatever the remainder is, we will use the remainder as an index. And to find that, we will use the modulus operator. So 100 divides by 10 evenly. The remainder is zero. So 100 modulus 10 gives us a remainder of zero. So SpongeBob's entry, we will place at index zero within our hash table. So the hash of Patrick's key is 123. 123 modulus 10 gives us a remainder of three. Patrick's entry will be inserted at index three of our hash table. So here's a little shortcut. If you have a number modulus 10, you can find the remainder and that is the last digit. 321 modulus 10 will give us a remainder of 1. Sandy's entry will be placed at index 1. Then Squidward's entry will be placed at index 5. 555 modulus 10 is 5. And Gary's will be at index 7 following the same pattern. Now here's one situation. What if two hashes are calculated to be the same value? That is known as a collision. And I can best demonstrate that with a separate example. In this next example, let's say that each key is now a string. Each entry is a pair of strings. We will first need to find the hash of each of these keys. So the hash code of a string uses a different formula. Basically speaking, we're going to take the ASCII value of each character within the string and plug it into this formula. I went ahead and calculated the hash of each of these strings using this formula of the string hash code method. And the next steps are the same as before. Take each hash divided by the capacity of our hash table and find the remainder. So beginning with the first hash, 48,625 modulus 10 gives us a remainder of five. SpongeBob's entry is now at index five within our hash table. Now Patrick's will be at index zero. Now here's Sandy's. Sandy's will also be zero. We have a collision. Both of these entries will be located at the same index. So what do we do? Each of these storage locations is also known as a bucket. And the most common resolution for a collision in a hash table is that we will turn each bucket into a linked list. If this bucket already has an entry, within the first entry, we will also add an address to the location of the next entry and keep on adding more if there's more entries within this bucket. So in this way, this becomes a linked list. If we're looking up a key, we first go to the index in which it's located. If there's more than one entry, we will search linearly through this bucket as if it were a linked list until we find the key that we're looking for. So that's the most common resolution when there is a collision. But ideally, you would want each of these entries to be within their own bucket. Based on the hash of Squidward's key, Squidward's entry has an index of 9. And Gary? Gary has an index of 5, and there's another collision. We will add the address of Gary's location to the first entry, and this bucket becomes a separate linked list. This process is known as chaining. The less collisions that there are, the more efficient that this hash table is going to look up a value. 
Ideally, you would want each entry to have their own bucket, but collisions are possible. To reduce the number of collisions, you can increase the size of the hash table, but then again, the hash table is going to use up more memory then, so people usually find a balance between the two. So yeah, those are hash tables in theory. Let's create our own now. All right, everybody. So let's implement a hash table in Java. So we will need to declare this hash table and list the data types of our key value pairs. If we need to store primitive data types, we can use the appropriate wrapper class. So let's store integers and strings. Integer and string. The integers will be the keys, the strings will be the values. We'll map student ID numbers and student names. And I'll name this hash table just simply table. Equals new hash table. There we go. So in Java, when we create a hash table, these have an initial capacity of 11 elements and a load factor of 0.75. So once 75% of our elements are filled, this hash table will dynamically expand to accommodate more elements. Now you can set a different capacity for your hash table. Instead of 11, let's say 10 to be consistent with our example in the previous part of this lesson. And if you would like to change the load factor, you can add that as well. Instead of 75%, let's say 50%. So we would pass in a floating point number. So 0 0.5, then add an F at the end for floating point numbers. But in this example, let's just keep the load factor consistent. So let's start adding some key value pairs. To add an element to your hash table, use the put method. So table dot put, and then we will pass in an integer as the key and a string as the value. So our first student is SpongeBob. He has a student ID of let's say 100. And let's pass in a string for the value, SpongeBob. Okay, that is our first student. So let's add a couple more from the previous example. So we have SpongeBob, Patrick with an ID of 123, Sandy with an ID of 321, Squidward with an ID of 555, and Gary with an ID of 777. Now to access one of these values, you can use the get method of tables. So I'll display this within a print line statement. Table.get, and I will pass in a key. Let's get the value at key number 100. So this student is SpongeBob. How can we display all of the key value pairs of a table? Well, we could use a for loop. So I'm going to create a for loop and place this within it. So to iterate over the keys of our table, this is what we can write. We can use an enhanced for loop. So we are iterating over integers. So the data type is integer, key, colon. So to make our hash table iterable, we can get all of the keys from our table and put them within a set. A set is iterable. So we will iterate over table.keyset method. This will take all of our keys and return a set. And a set is something we can iterate over. And within our print line statement, let's print each key, key plus, then maybe I'll add a tab to separate these, plus table dot get, then pass in whatever our key is. Okay, so after running this, this will display all of our key value pairs. And if you need to remove an entry, well, there's a remove method table dot remove, then pass in a key. Let's remove Gary. So remove the entry with this key 777. And Gary is no longer within our table. But we'll keep him in I'll turn this line into a comment. Now just to get a better understanding of where these key value pairs are being placed. Let's also display each hash code for each of these elements. So preceding our key, let's display each hash code. I'll precede our key with a tab. And let's display each key's hash code, key.hashcode method. If we're using the hash code of integers, this will return the primitive integer value represented by the key that we're passing in. If we're using the hash code method of integers, well, the hash is going to end up being the same integer. So you can see that these numbers are the same. To calculate an index, we can follow the hash with modulus operator, then the size of our table. We set this to originally be 10. So we have Gary at index 7, Squidward at index 5, Patrick at 3, Sandy at 1, SpongeBob at 0. 
Now, if our data type was strings, we would use a different hashing formula. So let's change the data type to string, and all of these keys are now strings. Then let's remove modulus 10 and change the data type of our for loop to strings, string key. Okay, these are the new hashes for each of our keys. This key has this hash number, this key has this hash number, so on and so forth. So different data types will have different hash code formulas. Now let's calculate the element in which each of these entries is going to be placed by adding modulus, the size of our hash table, 10. So here are the elements, and we actually have two collisions. We have a collision with these two keys. They're both within bucket five, as well as these two entries. So both of these will be placed into bucket zero. Since there's more than one entry within the same element, we will treat this bucket as a linked list and just iterate over it linearly until we reach the key that we're looking for. Now, one way in which we can avoid collisions is to increase the size of our hash table. If we set this to the default of 11, and change this to modulus 11, well then these will be placed within different buckets and you can see that they changed. However, we still have a collision with SpongeBob and Squidward. So what if we increase this to 21? Do we have any collisions then? Nope, we do not. These keys are within their own buckets. All right, everybody. So in conclusion, a hash table is a data structure that stores unique keys to values. When you declare a hash table, you state the data types of what you're storing, and these are reference data types. Each key value pair is known as an entry, and a benefit of hash tables is that they have a fast insertion, lookup, and deletion of key value pairs. But they're not ideal for small data sets, since there's a lot of overhead, but they're great with large data sets. Hashing in the context of a hash table takes a key and computes an integer, it utilizes a formula which will vary based on the key as input and its data type. Then to calculate an index, we follow this formula. We take a hash, modulus, the capacity of our table, to calculate an index. Each index is also known as a bucket. It's an indexed storage location for one or more entries. They can store more than one entry in the case of a collision. And in case that happens, we treat each bucket as a linked list. Each entry knows where the next entry is located. And as we discussed, a collision is when a hash function generates the same index for more than one key. Less collisions equals more efficiency. And the runtime complexity of a hash table varies. If there are no collisions, the best case would be a runtime complexity of big O of 1. It runs in constant time. In case there are exclusively collisions, as in we place all of our entries within the same bucket, it's going to be one giant linked list. And the runtime complexity of a linked list is big O of n. It runs in linear time. On average, the runtime complexity of a hash table will be somewhere within this range. So yeah, everybody, those are hash tables. If you would like a copy of all my notes here, I'll post them in the comments section down below. And well, yeah, those are hash tables in computer science.